As the sun had gone down and the mist that was almost fog was gathering over the Minsmere marshes, I hastened over the last mile of beach that lay between me and the darkening slope of Dunwich Heath. It was night when I reached the border of the heath. And even at night, I had easily found my way along the deeply rutted trackway that led to the crumbling ruins of the ancient town. Of all the aspects this heath presents at different times of the day and season of the year, I like its night aspect best, for then it has a somber face befitting a place made desolate by the sea. The hill we're standing on, immediately west, landward of the Church of St. James, the little 19th century Church of St. James, gives you the best idea you can possibly get anywhere of how it was to approach Dunnage. Dunnage has, as everybody knows, I imagine, almost entirely disappeared. Yet you can stand on this hill and you see a perfectly credible church built on the site of a leper hospital. You can see the ruins of the chapel of the leper hospital and it's no end of a Romanesque remain. It's a very solid piece of wall with arcading going round an apsidal, a curved east end. And you can almost imagine the master and the other people involved in ministering to the lepers of Dunwich uh, sitting around the leper hospital of St. James, which by its very nature was of course built at the very edge of the town. You didn't obviously set up a leper chapel bang in the middle of the town. And so you know you've reached the suburbs of what I think of as being one of the most interesting vanished places in the entire world. And I think of uh, Herculaneum in the same sort of breath. Thy pomp, thy power, O Dunwich, now's no more. Lost is thy splendor, sunk in endless night. Fair trade and commerce have forsook thy shore, and all thy pristine glories vanished quite. And sublunary things thus pass away. Old ocean's self shall thus a period find. The cloud-capped towers, the pompous domes decay. All, all dissolve, nor leave a wreck behind. When you're approaching it from this western side, the first thing you notice as you leave Wesselton village, the next village, you very quickly become aware of the straightness of the roads. And there's one very obvious example of this, where a straight road leaves the one you're on, and in fact, the Roman road forked, and you're on one fork. But there's a, a straight track, a, a wonderful stony track, leading straight to the place where we are, in fact, across a heath, and nobody can possibly have ar arrived in Dunwich without having noticed the fact that the Romans arrived here a good time ago before us. A mile and a quarter from the present shore was the Roman settlement. So erosion has been going on in Dunwich for pretty well 2,000 years that we know of. There was a time when Eastern Ness, near Southwold, was the easternmost point of England. But it is no longer. The Romans colonized this country, but today there remains no trace. And the waves roll incessantly shorewards to break at the foot of cliffs the Romans never knew. So that about the coast there clings a sad kind of romance. More than anywhere else around our sea-girdled land, we feel the spell of this romance at Dunwich, once the chief town and port on the East Anglian coast, now a shrunken hamlet, whose eventful past already seems a part of old mythology. Standing on the cliff today, one needs a poet's imagination to conjure up a picture of the strong-walled town that stretched far out to sea. Dunwich uh, seems to have been a borough way back in Saxon times and uh, certainly for several centuries in the Saxon period it was uh, an, an important place from 
630 onwards. It seems to have been the headquarters of the Diocese of East Anglia, because this is where the Burgundian monk Felix came to convert East Anglia to Christianity. And uh, in 635, he became the first bishop of Dunwich, and there was a bishop of Dunwich until sometime in the 9th century. So it was uh, uh, quite an important trading centre and also a religious centre in Saxon times. The very earliest historian to write about Dunwich was the Venerable Bede, and um, he wrote uh, quite eloquently about the coming of Christianity to East Anglia uh, uh, through Dunwich. Not long after Erpwald's acceptance of Christianity, he was killed by a pagan named Rickbert, and for three years the province relapsed into heathendom, until Erpwald's brother Sigbert succeeded to the kinship. Sigbert was a devout Christian and a man of learning, who had been an exile in Gaul during his brother's lifetime, and was there converted to the Christian faith, so that when he began his reign, he laboured to bring about the conversion of his whole realm. In this enterprise he was nobly assisted by Bishop Felix, who came to Archbishop Honorius from the Burgundian region, where he had been brought up and ordained, and by his own desire, was sent by him to preach the word of life to this nation of the Angles. Nor did he fail in his purpose, for, like a good farmer, he reaped a rich harvest of believers. He delivered the entire province from its age-old wickedness and infelicity, brought it to the Christian faith and works of righteousness, and, in full accord with the significance of his own name, guided it towards eternal felicity. His episcopal see was established at Dummock, and after ruling the province as its bishop for 17 years, he ended his days there in peace. One of the marvellous things about this early name for Dunnage, Dummock or Dummock Chester, it's sometimes called in Bede, it is that it does give you a feeling of great antiquity because Dummock is a Celtic word. Dummock I find interesting simply because it's one of these rarest of place names in Suffolk. All our place names are Anglo-Saxon with a very few, a dozen or so exceptions, very few Viking names and very few Celtic names, and this is one of them. So I think you can imagine in early Anglo-Saxon times, possibly when the bishop settled here, there was a, a Celtic-speaking group of people living alongside the English who were here, because otherwise the, the Celtic place name w would probably not have survived Dumbock or Dumbock. One of the problems we have studying the history of Dunwich is separating myths from what is really uh, history. And it's just an example of the kind of problem we've faced. Uh, in the time of Elizabeth I, a chronicler uh, listed the churches that were known to exist in Dunwich and made it a total come to 15. And then he went on to say that he wouldn't have recorded this except that many responsible citizens in the place had told him that there had been 52 churches. And uh, he said, I've no records of these whatsoever. And so, you know, please yourself whether you will believe it or not. And uh, I have always myself uh, treated that as one of the myths about Dunwich. But recently, studies in the history of the church have shown that in the late Saxon period, there was a free-for-all period in church building. And any landowner, merchant, wealthy enough to employ a priest in his household, um, not only to say prayers morning and, uh, and evening, but to perhaps educate children and so on, would, if he had the land available, uh, probably build the chap a church. And of course in those days churches were made of wood, and so there's very little that need be left of them uh, much later, later on. And um, I have recently learned from a recent work on the history of churches in, in uh, Norwich that there were in Norwich about 62 churches at this period. 
and uh, Norwich was larger than Dunwich, but not all that larger. And so therefore, I've now been forced to wonder whether Dunwich itself perhaps did have somewhere around about 50 churches in that period when church building was a free-for-all business and there wasn't the parochial discipline uh, imposed on it. Dunwich is so enveloped in the halo of traditionary splendour that he who ventures to elucidate its history by pursuing the path of topographical inquiry must exercise unusual caution lest he be misled by imaginary light. The steady ray which truth might have shed over its earliest origin is almost wholly extinguished by the violent assaults of the ocean. For unlike those ruined cities whose fragments attest their former grandeur, Dunwich is wasted, desolate and void. Its palaces and temples are no more, and its very environs present an aspect lonely, stern and wild. The reason why it became uh, a centre is that the coastline there uh, was a big open bay which provided um, a sheltered anchorage for shipping. Now, after this, the coast changed somewhat so that the open bay of Saxon times became a landlocked harbour by about the time of the Norman conquest. And this then was most certainly the, one of the best harbours, if not the best harbour, anywhere around the coast of East Anglia. And that was the basis of the prosperity of this town. Uh, shipping could uh, uh, come in and out here very safely. There was a good deal of trading along the east coast of England, um, and north uh, as far as Scotland, down to London, and across to the continent. And we know that uh, Dunwich traders found their way to all sorts of places on the continent, even round to the Mediterranean. So it was a, a prosperous, very busy place. The Doomsday Survey of, of 1086 is the best starting point, really, for trying to calculate the size of Dunwich. And the entry is quite a startling one. And it appears that the Normans, as, as new conquerors of, of England, were developing Dunwich as a kind of entrepot. And its population seems to have risen rapidly in the 20 years after the Battle of Hastings. And Doomsday Book records this very clearly. And from the numbers of people recorded in Doomsday Book, most historians, I think, would accept that Dunwich had a population of about 3,000 in 1086. Now, the population of England rose probably threefold in the next two centuries. We know that Dunwich reached its peak in about 1200, 1210. And I think it wouldn't be extreme to suggest that Dunwich may have doubled its population during that time. So that at its peak, Dunwich might have had about 6,000 people. The tendency has been amongst historians in the last decade to upgrade urban estimates during this period. There's a much greater degree of urbanization in England than was previously thought likely or indeed possible. So at its peak, Dunwich would have been a very sizable town indeed, possibly in the top five ports in England and perhaps even in the top 15 or 20 um, towns. That's a little speculative. There was a large fishing fleet here of between 40 and 50 vessels catching a lot of fish. This fish had to be smoked, salted and grilled, put into casks ready for export to Europe. Dunwich also had its own shipyards. They could build up to 11 ships at a time, small boats made from the oak from the local forests. Merchants from the continent came over to Dunwich, settled here, and of course travelled around East Anglia, buying up what was produced in those days, which was mainly wool, corn, and something which is not produced in this part of the country today, cheese. Now these goods were all taken down to the harbour and with the fish exported out to Europe. 
Coming back, of course, those merchants made sure that the ships came back filled with produce which they could sell in this country. This was mainly building materials and stonework from France, cloth from Belgium, salt for the fishing industry, that came from the Bay of Biscay, steel came from Spain, furs from Russia, pitch for the shipbuilding, that came from Scandinavia, and of course, wine came from France and Germany. It was a town of eight parishes, two hospitals, two monasteries, The delightful period that Henry James spent in Dunwich was not misspent. His description of what he found at the Greyfriars ruins exactly describes what he saw. It is an immense cincture. It's one of the biggest, longest bits of enclosure by a stone wall that I'm aware of. At any rate, an enclosure with almost nothing in it except the surviving refectory, the place where the Franciscan friars ate. There they stand, really rather lonely, in the middle of this great marvellous space with horses grazing peacefully. The fact that it survives the inroads of the sea suggests that, again, we're looking at something in a landward suburb, a westerly suburb, of the city of Dunwich. It did, in fact, start, like so many of the friaries, in the middle of the town because they were people who did the kind of job that we tend to leave to social services and so on. Now, they were very good at keeping an eye on poor people and, and feeding hungry people and all those things, as well as preaching fairly radical sermons. And one of the things that they had unfortunately to do was to pick up their brown robes and brought themselves just outside the town wall and indeed they share as their boundary the site of the palisade and the ditch that surrounded the west side of this ancient town. So here we are reduced once more to looking at in fact a suburban building but one of great I defy anyone at desolate, exquisite Dunwich to be disappointed in anything. The minor key is struck here with a felicity that leaves no sigh to be breathed, no loss to be suffered. Dunwich is not even the ghost of its dead self. Almost all you can say of it is that it consists of the mere letters of its old name. There is a presence in what is missing. There is history in there being so little. It is so little today that every item of the handful counts. As we've already said, the Roman settlement had gone, the Saxon town had gone. By the time of the Norman conquest, the sea had reached this medieval town. But the Normans brought over a method to stop the erosion. The town stretched for a mile along the shore on sandy cliffs. And what they did was this. Each autumn, the men of the town were put to work to put faggots of brushwood against the uh, base of the cliff. Um, any shingle that was on the beach was pushed up against these faggots to reinforce them. This kept the sea away from the cliffs they did this each autumn for just over 200 years, during which time there was virtually no erosion at all. Dunwich continued to prosper. So now what went wrong? Well, around this coast you've got two very unstable materials, sand and shingle, continually being moved around. During storms, sand and shingle are moved around dramatically. And one night in January 1286, just over 700 years ago, a storm washed a million tons of shingle into the mouth of this harbour, completely blocking it. For all intents and purposes, 
Dunwich Harbour then was finished. So the Dunwich, uh, which had been made by the sea, was destroyed in one night by the sea. A second storm, about 50 years later, completely finished the job uh, and made the River Blythe, which had been going into the sea up to that time here, change its course and go into the sea where it does today, two miles north of here at Walkerswick. But Dunnage was finished as, as a uh, important commercial centre and a port. There seems to therefore have been an intensity of storm activity in this 75 years before the Black Death. And there is a parallel here with storm activity elsewhere in South East England, from about the Humber around to the Sussex coast. There seems to be recurrent storm, recurrent marine inundations on marginal exposed sites where soft cliffs or marshland had been reclaimed in previous centuries. In an attempt to explain this, historians have tried to bracket it into a period of general climatic change. Historians and climatologists accept that in general there was a medieval warm epoch, a warming, where perhaps mean summer temperatures were something like one degree centigrade higher, around 1200 than they are today. And one of the possible symptoms of this is an increase in storm activity. And it might be that as the temperature gradient differential between the Arctic and between the Atlantic Gulf Stream changed, and as a consequence, you get storm surges down the North Sea. And this meant that all the efforts they'd made to protect the coast from erosion by building a wall made of shingle along the beach, reinforced by brushwood, that ceased. And as a result, uh, the sandy cliffs on which the town stood were being steadily eroded away. Between something like 1280 and 1345, something like 600 houses and buildings of various sorts must have disappeared, the best part of perhaps six medieval parishes. Most of the town was abandoned. In 1300, St. Leonard's Church started to go into the sea. One of the ways in which you can tell, uh, roughly, when the sea got its way with the church is when the diocesan authorities ceased to replace the incumbent and this wasn't because there was a shortage of priests it was because the church had, had been washed away or, or was threatened with washing away I mean one of the churches in question was St Nicholas's church which was w way to the south of where we're standing right at the southern end of the town a mile from where we're standing I suppose and it was still on the edge of the sea. I mean, it disappeared in the 1350s, and, and yet people could still see the ruins being washed by the sea in Elizabeth I's time. As any of these churches got near to the cliff edge, they were abandoned as a parish church. Everything of value was taken out of them, such as the bells, the timber, a lot of the stonework was taken away and sold to be used again, and the churches were just left as a ruin to fall into the sea. We know from our next secure um, demographic base, which is a list of burgesses and taxpayers in about 1400. The population of the town was then something like a thousand. And medievalists have to juggle statistics and make a number of inspired guesses in an attempt to bridge the two peers, the 6,000 figure and the 1,000 figure. So in about 1340, after this period of acute sea storms, Dunwich would probably have had a population of about two and a half, 
2,000 people. The decline would not really have been due to direct losses. I, I don't think one would see the loss of life that one does, say, in Bangladesh at times of serious flooding. I think people would have realised when a, a large spring tide was coming and would have moved away from the danger zone in Dunwich. The problem was, and the problem with, with any medieval town, is that they were demographic plug holes. They were dirty, infectious disease, etc. Very high mortality rates. So the only way that a town can sustain its size, not grow, but merely sustain its size in the Middle Ages, is to have a constant influx of immigrants. Now, once the port has been blocked at Dunwich in the late 13th century, and once opportunities for trade decline drastically, which they do, there is no incentive for immigrants to move to Dunwich. And as a consequence, I think the town would have begun to lose population. The Black Death then came along in 1349, and everybody agrees that it killed something like a third to perhaps even a half of the population of East Anglia in three months after March 1349. And I think the same would almost certainly have been true in Dunwich. When building the present modern church in Dunwich, which was on the site, of the um, medieval hospital, uh, the uh, people digging for the foundations of that church found that they were digging into a mass grave. Now, this was part of the lepers' colony, but you didn't need a mass grave for lepers. Um, they only resorted to a mass grave during the Black Death if people were dying so rapidly that they couldn't provide individual graves for, for each person as, as, as they died, which shows that the, the Black Death was pretty severe in Dunwich. As the harbour mouth became blocked in the 13th century and as it migrated northwards until eventually it stood outside Walberswick, which had in the 12th century been an upriver port, so Dunwich was faced with another problem and that was trying to control access over the harbour. In the 12th century, all ships coming in and out of Dunwich River had to trade at Dunwich. It was part of the town's charter of privileges. But clearly, as the entrance to the river migrated northward, so actually enforcing this became more of a problem. And throughout the 13th and 14th century, Dunwich was embroiled in a series of bitter, acrimonious and expensive legal battles with Walberswick over who precisely had the right to control trade in and out of the harbour mouth. In the late 14th century, the, the lord of Walberswick, Sir Roger Swillington, who was a very impressive man who fought at Agincourt, decided to boycott the paying of dues at Dunwich and supported the fishing fleet of Walberswick's boycotting of, of paying dues and also switched a fair, which he had a right to hold, onto the disputed marshland surrounding the harbour mouth. And this pushed the whole legal issue of who controlled the rights of the harbour into the open. And in the event, the Dunwich burgesses, who had spent the last two centuries desperately trying to avoid legal action at the king's court where their somewhat tenuous claims to run the harbour might have been exposed for the tenuous claims they were. In the end, Swillington, by, by a master um, stroke of, of manoeuvring and um, legal expertise, managed to get Dunwich to the um, king's court and in the 1410s it became apparent that Dunwich had no rights to control the harbour. And as a consequence, this really exacerbated the, the, the decline in Dunwich. They no longer had rights to force ships to trade at their harbour, and they could simply go up into Walberswick. Within this uh, wall of the Greyfriars, at one stage when you're walking across the middle of the site, you get a breathtaking view across the bay, across the sea, of Walberswick, which is a, another village involved in the whole strange saga of the failure of Dunwich on account of the activity of the sea. Walberswick was another of the places that for a short time did extremely well in seagoing trade. And as a result, one of the grandest towers in East Anglia, one of the grandest churches in East Anglia, 
was built. The church, because of, again, it, it failed. When Southwell grew, Walberswick failed. And all that's really left of that wonderful church is a, a really distinguished piece of medieval architecture. It isn't exactly like a sort of Italian campanile, um, but it's one of the best things that we can put against uh, the sort of campaniles that you go to Florence to see. It's a very handsome building. And from here, in the middle of the, of the Greyfriars in Dunwich, you get this lovely view across the bay to Southwold, and you see Southwold's own tower, Walberswick's tower, and a rather striking white lighthouse tower. Southwold was the great inheritor of all that Dunwich had once stood for. It has a wonderful church, but it has such a charming prosperity, and it really, it, it, it must feel a bit guilty occasionally when, when it looks south and sees poor old Dunwich in a sort of tumble-down, ruined condition. of the uh, settlement here, of course, declined dramatically. And by the 18th century, there was a small group of fishermen earning a living by fishing off this coast. They probably combined that with farmers, some of them just farming. So fishing and, and farming provided a livelihood for the remaining population of, of, of the town. 1540, St. John's Church had gone. It became a little local market town. Shortly after that, the people of Dunwich had to once more start moving. So it reached the market town. By 1712, St. Peter's Church had gone. From its heyday in the 13th century, the town of Dunwich had established the right to send two MPs annually to Parliament. We know from lists of these MPs in the late 13th and early 14th century that they were good, solid Dunwich burgesses, born and bred, who would simply go down to London, conduct some of the town's business whilst they were there, and also attend the Parliament. The discovery of a town notebook from the early 15th century makes it clear that Dunwich was still sending its own burgesses down to London. However, there are hints of difficulties. All MPs were, by law, supposed to receive two shillings expenses each per day. The Dunwich burgesses, however, were being allotted much smaller sums than this, nine pence, ten pence a day, which certainly wasn't enough. Um, to sustain oneself in the appropriate manner when at Parliament. And this reflects a growing civic insolvency at Dunnett later in the 15th century. It's clear that the people who were representing Dunwich as MPs at Parliament were no longer burgesses of the town. A transition had occurred, and without doubt, Dunwich is now on the way to becoming the rotten borough that it was notorious for in later centuries. So at some stage in the late 14th, 15th century, a transition has been made. By the end of the 15th century, it's clear that politically ambitious gentry or anybody from outside Dunwich were prepared to represent the town at Parliament. For this, it's doubtful that they were paid expenses by Dunwich. They probably regarded the political influence and the social status that went with being an MP as sufficient. They may have received a barrel of the inevitable herring, because that's all Dunwich really had to pay anybody with by the late 15th century for their efforts. This sort of controversy went on and until we get to the 18th century, where by which time the population of the borough was down to something like 200 people with a very small number of freemen, and uh, there was in danger of their losing their parliamentary franchise.
but they then were admitting outsetters, uh, people from outside to be freemen of the borough, and this went on. The uh, elections could be rigged because the uh, people sort of controlling the politics of this borough uh, could perhaps bring in a lot of outsiders who were more numerous than the freemen actually resident in the borough. And there was much controversy went on with disputed elections and all that sort of thing until eventually almost the whole of the borough passed into the hands of the Downing family round about 1720. And because the Downings then virtually owned the borough, they were also, in various ingenious ways, able to control the way that the freemen voted. So that virtually this became a pocket borough, and the Downings uh, required their tenants to always elect one of the Downings to be the Member of Parliament. The second seat went to somebody that they nominated, and they were always able to charge the other person a thousand pounds at each election for that second seat. Uh, this was the sort of thing that went on. And indeed, that went on right to um, 1832, when Dunnage was one of the rotten boroughs that lost its parliamentary representation as a result of the Reform Act passed in that year. Coming back to more recent times, All Saints Church went into the sea between 1903 and 1919. To give you an idea of the rate of erosion at the beginning of this century, All Saints Church was 43 metres long and it went in 17, 18 years. So it was well over two metres a year. We've now reached the point, the rather alarming point, on the seaward side of the great surrounding wall of the Priory, and technically we're within the boundaries of the ancient town, and we're also treading among the graves of the last of the medieval churches, the graves of all saints. And we're really, where, where I'm speaking, we're only 20 yards or so from the edge of the cliff. And uh, you might even be able to hear, I suppose, the sea lapping at the foot of the cliff. But at any rate, this is really uh, part of the city of Dunwich that we're standing in. And there's very little of it left, a strip of a very few yards uh, running along the cliff top. Here then, in the churchyard of All Saints is uh, the remains of one headstone to a fellow called Jacob Forster who departed this life on the 12th of March, 1796, aged 38. And he represents now one of the very few people whose names are recollected. There was for a long time near here, a, a charming headstone to a person called John Brinkley Easy. Geoffrey Grigson, when he was here, noticed this particular headstone. I always liked it because I've always lived around here, and I know how far back in these parts the names of Brinkley and Easy go. And it was sad that the headstone with John Brinkley Easy's name on it, uh, disappeared not long ago. Not only uh, are, the, are the names moving, but there is just one piece of uh, simple local verse that survives on one of the fragmentary headstones, and it's, it's a fairly commonplace thing, but it says, reader, depart not from this stone till you've pondered where I'm gone. Death quickly took my strength away and laid me in this bed of clay. Uh, the only sense in which I can actually dissent from that is that one of its troubles, this clay, is that it is extremely sandy and it presents no kind of um, opposition to the sea. When the sea approaches, it just has its way with this cliff and there's almost no sense in which you can attempt to stop it. Each winter, we're still losing one or two metres of cliff 
every time there is a small amount of cliff fall down, skulls and bones are found on the beach. And at certain periods you can even see them sticking out of the cliff edge. In December 1990, a very bad storm took six metres in one night. Suffolk's quite um, famous for its light, as we can see with all the painters who've come here, this special kind of pink light that you get, sort of slightly diffuse light. And I think we, Dunwich is a very good place for that, that you, you have this sense of changing light, and you'll be walking through the woods, and the light is sort of slightly murky and diffuse, sometimes actually a sea mist, and then suddenly you'll see the sun rise up over the ocean and uh, these wonderful bright sunbeams coming out, which clears the light and intensifies the light quite considerably. It's basically one small street with um, houses simply on one side of it, very much in a similar vein to what one imagines a medieval street might have looked like, overlooking the marsh. Uh, with the marsh harrier birds swooping over the marshes. There's one, one pub, no shop, one fish and chip shop that people come for miles around to buy the fish and chips in the summer. There's the fishermen and the, the lovely boats going out to fish every morning. And there's the long bit of beach. And then there's, um, on the hill, there's another collection of houses, but um, altogether there's just only just over 100 people. So it's a very modest, humble, simple place to be compared to the massive medieval city with all its cathedrals and churches and hospitals and good works. Something of its ancientness, something of its atmosphere, uh, something of the, the sense that there were once many monasteries and different groups of spiritually based people who lived here means that perhaps unconsciously people are drawn here because of its healing nature and the sense of um, this great city that's disappeared under the waves is a great reminder of uh, our fragility perhaps that uh, we don't have to be constantly in control all the time that it's a good reminder of not to become too omnipotent cliff uprears its rugged head, where frowns the ruin o'er the silent dead, where sweeps the billow of the lonely shore, where once the mighty lived but lived no more, where proudly frowned the convent's massy wall, where rose the gothic tower, the stately hall, where bards proclaimed and warriors shared the feast, where ruled the baron and where knelt the priest, there stood the city in its pride. Tis gone mocked at by crumbling pile and mouldering stone and shapeless masses which the reckless power of time hath hurled from ruined arch and tower o'er the lone spot where shrines and pillared halls once gorgeous shone the clammy lizard crawls o'er the lone spot where yawned the guarded foss creeps the wild bramble and the spreading moss oh Time hath bowed that lordly city's brow in which the mighty dwelt. Where dwell they now?
the speakers in Dunnage, Time Trieth Reality were Norman Scarf, Ormond Pickard, Morton Keynes, Mark Bailey and Elizabeth McCormack. The readers were Nigel Carrington and Caroline John. Research was by Jean Martin and George Hyde. And the programme was produced by David Perry.